Praise the Lord. Exodus chapter 27, starting in verse 1. Amen. That's why you got to bring your Bibles, amen, because up on the TV it's the wrong verse, but amen. Yeah. Amen. So you don't count on the TV to give you your scripture. It may be wrong, amen. So, amen. Always bring your Bible with you. Exodus chapter 27, and we'll start in verse 1. We welcome those that may be um, listening to this teaching on internet. Praise the Lord. We welcome you tonight. Um, We're going to continue in our study of the tabernacle. Amen. Starting in verse 1. Chapter 27. Exodus. When you have it, you can either stand or just say amen so we know everybody is ready. Amen. Amen. And it says, And you shall make an altar of shaitan wood, five cubits long and five cubits broad. The altar shall be four square, and the height thereof shall be three cubits. And we'll stop right there. Amen. Heavenly Father, Lord, we love you. And Father, I just ask the real, real teacher come forth, Lord, and let him do the teaching tonight, Lord. And Help me, Lord, anoint me, Lord, anoint your people to hear and understand um, how the tabernacle represented your son, Jesus Christ. And Lord, we'll give you all the praise and glory in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Um, Again, I said uh, when we started the series on the tabernacle, we would start on the outside and work our way in. Amen. Uh, Two Thursdays ago, we uh, did an intro about what the tabernacle really represented. It was a type of Christ. Amen. And last Thursday, we talked about the uh, curtain, the fence that went around about the tabernacle and the outer court. And then tonight, we're going to get into the brazen altar. And we're going to talk about what the brazen altar was, what it typified. And then we're going to dive into the five different offerings that were given in the Old Testament and how it typified the sacrifice that Jesus would do. Amen. And if you probably can't see it on internet, um, those that may be watching, but here we have on the TV a picture. It's a scale model, actually. It's in Israel, in the area of Judea. They made an actual tabernacle of what it would have looked like out in the wilderness. Amen. And here, as I said last Thursday, we did the two Thursdays, we did the intro. And then last Thursday, we did what the fencing uh, typified, and really it was fine linen. It was... uh, White as snow, and it typified God's righteousness. Amen. And from the outside, a sinner, sinner looking at that, all he could see was God's righteousness. Amen. And just as I said, and in today's world, somebody looks at the Bible, all they see is God's righteousness. Thou shalt not have any other gods. You shall not use the Lord's name in vain. Amen. You shall honor your mother and your father. And they just see God's righteousness. That's all they can see. Amen. But when you went into the tabernacle, now you had the righteousness of God surrounding you. Amen. Just how when you accepted Christ, you are in Christ, and now you have Christ's righteousness. And it was the same way in the Old Testament. On the outside, your righteousness was as filthy rags, but the minute, and you would look at that fence, and all you could see was the righteousness of God. Amen. But when you would go into that court, you would have the righteousness of God surrounding you now. Amen. We see that in the book of Revelations where it talks about the believers putting on a robe of righteousness, the white. We see that how we're in Christ and we have Christ's righteousness. And we see here in the Old Testament how somebody would go into the court of the tabernacle and they would have the righteousness of God surrounding them. Amen. But on the outside, if you were to look at the tabernacle, all you could see was God's righteousness, the white. Amen. And so that's what we talked about as a review last Thursday. Amen. We talked about the door. The only way into the tabernacle was the door. That's what Jesus was talking about when he said, I am the door. Every single Israelite knew what he was talking about. He was talking about the door that went into the tabernacle or into the outer court that which led to the tabernacle. Amen. And when a believer or a sinner would go in through the door, the first thing they would be met with, amen, was this, the brazen altar. Amen. When you came through the door to Christ Jesus, the first thing you're met with is the cross. Amen. 
And this is the first thing Israelites or the Jews would see when they would enter into the tabernacle, the brazen altar. You couldn't get any farther. Amen. You couldn't get to the altar of incense. You couldn't get in the tabernacle. You couldn't even get to the um, laver. Amen. You couldn't get anywhere until you first went to the brazen altar. Amen. Which was a type of the cross. And it's the same in the New Testament. You can't get prayer. You can't get blessings. You can't get salvation. You can't get sanctification. Amen. You can't get the word of God washing you until you first go through the cross. Amen. And we see here the uh, brazen altar was five cubics long, five cubics wide, and three cubics tall. Amen. Which translated out today um, in English, seven and a half feet wide, seven and a half feet long, and four and a half feet tall. Amen. And as we read here in the scriptures, in verse 2, it says, And you shall make the horns of it upon the four corners thereof. His horns shall be of the same, and you shall overlay it with brass. Amen. As you can see here, there was four horns put on the altar. Amen. And it was all overlaid with brass. And another word for brass is copper. And the reason of that is brass or copper typified the judgment. Amen. And the suffering that Christ would do. Everything in the outer court was of brass or silver. There was no gold. Amen. There was no gold in the outer court or in any of the vessels on the outside. And people would ask, well, why is that? Why was there no gold? Why was it only silver and brass? Gold represented his deity. Amen. Silver represented the redemption. Amen. And the brass or the copper represented his sufferings. So when you would go through the door, all you would see is copper and brass and maybe some silver on the posts with the fence. But you wouldn't see no gold. And the reason being there was no gold in the outer court is because he laid aside his deity. Amen. But if you went on the inside of the tabernacle, there was gold. Amen. If you go on the inside of the tabernacle, there was gold. Amen. Let me uh, go back a slide and let me show you. All of this area, the posts had silver on them, and they were overlaid with brass, and every vessel was overlaid with brass, but out here there was no gold, typifying that he laid aside his deity. Amen. So the sinner on the outside, all he could see was God's righteousness, amen, and the redemption, amen, and the suffering he would go through for them. But there would be nothing attractive to the natural eye. Because his deity was laid aside. But the minute somebody would go into the tabernacle, it would be beautiful. There would be gold everywhere, amen. There would be silver, gold, brass, amen. That's the same way in the new covenant. On the outside, the world can't understand what's so great about Christ. Because all they see is God's righteousness. Thou shalt not do this. Thou shalt not do that. Thou shalt not do this. Thou shalt not do that. Thou shalt not do this. And all they see is a man... Well, why would I follow a man who was impaled on a pole? I don't see no greatness in that. Amen. But when you accept that, and you become a believer, amen, and you're able to go into the tabernacle, oh, you see how rich and how beautiful and how glorious it really is and how Christ really is. Amen. But again, they would be met with the brazen altar, which was all of brass or copper. Amen. No gold. Amen. And there would be four horns at the top. And the horns represented strength and it represented power. Amen. And not only that, amen, it represented how the cross would give us victory and triumph over sin. Amen. So sin shall not have dominion over us anymore. Amen. It also represented strength. This is where the Christian strength lies, is in the cross. For the preaching of the cross is to them who perish foolishness, but unto us who are saved, it is the power of God. Amen. And of course, all the vessels uh, as well that went along with the brazen altar, there was a pan 
um, made of copper that would go under to collect the ashes. And there would be a grate of copper, amen, that would go in this brazen altar where they would be able to set the lamb and the sacrifices on. Amen. And not only that, copper was more fire resistant than even gold or silver. Amen. So it protected the wood, amen, that laid the foundation of the altar. Amen. And this is the heart of the gospel. In the Old Testament, this was the heart, amen, of the redemption plan. Amen. This brazen altar was the heart of everything. You couldn't go anywhere else, amen, except through the brazen altar. And it's the same in the New Testament. I don't care where you go in the Bible, amen. The cross is the heart of the gospel. Amen. And if you take this out, if you took the brazen altar out of the tabernacle, there was no way to God. Amen. There was no way to get to the Lord. He wouldn't hear your prayers. Amen. You couldn't be cleansed by the word, which the laver represented. Amen. You couldn't get the oil. You couldn't get the bread. You couldn't, there was, if you took this out, Amen. You have no gospel. If you take the cross out of the Bible, you have no gospel. Amen. And so this was the heart, amen, of the old covenant, the brazen altar. Just as the cross is the heart, amen, of the new covenant, of the New Testament. Because without blood, there's no remissions of sin. Without blood, there is no remissions of sin. Amen. And so, again, I can't stress that enough. Amen. I know uh, I've heard preachers say it's the cross, the cross, the cross. And that's right. In the Old Testament, they would have, preachers would have said it's the brazen altar, it's the brazen altar, it's the brazen altar. Amen. Amen. Because without this, we're doomed. Yeah. Amen. There's no way to the Lord. None whatsoever. Amen. So while this was at the heart, there were several offerings as well that would be given on this. Amen. Amen. And the first offering, and I'm going to try to take my time in this because I've got five offerings that we're going to get through tonight. The first offering was the whole burnt offering. And that's found in the book of Leviticus, uh, starting with chapter 1, verse 1. It was called the whole burnt offering. Now, the whole burnt offering was instituted... In the book of Leviticus. Amen. The whole burnt offering actually had been going on prior to this. If you read in the book of Genesis. Noah after the floods receded. Gave a burnt offering unto the Lord. Abraham. Amen. Was called an altar builder. Everywhere he went. He would build altars and give burnt offerings to the Lord. So the whole burnt offering wasn't something new. But the Lord wanted to instruct Israel. On how the burnt offering was supposed to be. Amen. And the burnt offering was the most common offering that the Israelites would give. There was normally a burnt offering that was supposed to be done in the morning, uh, on the third hour, and there was supposed to be a burnt offering that was done on the ninth hour in the evening. Amen. And we know Christ hung on the cross from the third hour to the ninth hour, from nine o'clock to three o'clock. Amen. And so this was the most common burnt offering. Amen. And it was, the idea of this offering was self-surrender, meaning you was giving yourself wholly to the Lord. Amen. Every part of you was given to the Lord. Amen. Just kind of like when you got saved, you gave everything to the Lord. said, Lord, I'm yours. Amen. And this was a type and shadow of what Christ would do for us. Amen. How salvation would come. Amen. Through him giving him whole self for us and us giving our whole self to his redemption plan. Amen. The whole burnt offering. And this was done on a voluntary basis as well. And I'll just go through of the instructions on how the burnt offering was supposed to be instituted. Number one, you would bring a male sheep or lamb or cattle or some herd, amen, through the door of the tabernacle and you would bring them to this. And I could only imagine the sight that a, a sinner would see as they was bringing their sheep or their goat. And they would go through this tabernacle or this door, amen. They would be met with this thing. And it was a gruesome thing to see. 
Amen. You would see the flames up on the brazen altar. You'd see smoke billowing up. You would have the stench of flesh. Amen. Which didn't smell very good. You would have blood spilled round about this altar everywhere on the sides, on the ground. Amen. You could see probably where there might have been footprints and hoof tracks of blood everywhere. It was gruesome. The cross doesn't look pretty and neither did this. It would be a gruesome sight, amen, to see the flames, the stench, the smoke, and blood everywhere. But it was the only way to the Lord. It was the only way to the Lord. And so somebody would bring in their offering, amen, and they would... It had to be without spot or blemish. And what they would do is they would take this animal and they would take a rope and they would hand it over to the priest. And the priest would take it and he would wrap it around one of these horns to keep the animal there. Amen. And then the priest would inspect the lamb or the cattle or whatever it was to make sure it had no blemishes on it. Amen. And after he got done inspecting it, the offerer would place his hand on the animal typifying how his sins was being transferred to the animal. Amen. A type and shadow of how Christ would be our substitute on the cross. Amen. And after he would place his hand on the animal, the priest, amen, would hand him a knife. And he would have to take that knife. And as he would take that knife, that priest would lift up on that animal to expose the throat. And then the offerer had to take the knife and kill the animal and slit the throat. If you could take your, amen, now, I know we don't have no sheep at home, but just for instance, as an analogy, take your pet that you have, maybe a dog or a cat. Could you imagine, amen, having to take that animal, take it before a priest, amen, and take the leash and tie it up, and the person would hold up the animal and give you the knife, and you'd have to kill it. Amen. And bloods would spill out everywhere on the ground and in the basin. This, well, why did the Lord do this? Why was it this way? Because the Lord wanted people to see the awfulness of sin. Amen. How horrible sin really is. And the cost would be to have to pay that debt by the killing of innocent blood. Amen. And so there would be a basin at the bottom where some of the blood would spill in to this from after the animal was slit. And the priest, amen, he would take the blood and he would sprinkle it round about this altar. Amen. And then the offerer, while he was doing that, would fillet the hide, meaning skin the hide, and take that knife and have to cut that animal into bits. Amen. Showing how deep sin really goes. Goes to the heart of man. Amen. Man's problem is not on the surface, but it's deep in the heart of, with sin. Amen. So he would cut that animal into pieces. And the priest would then take the pieces of that animal and then throw it up on this altar to burn it. Amen. But the priest would then take the inward parts. Amen. He would take the inward parts of that beast after it was all cut up and he would wash it in water. Wash the inwards of it first. And then he would take those inner parts and then throw that on the brazen altar as well. Amen. Amen. Well, why would he, if he's going to throw it on the altar and burn it anyways, what is the point of washing something if you're going to burn it? Amen. This typified, amen, that man's problem wasn't washing the outside, but was washing the inside of man. Amen. The problem lied within, and that's what has to be cleaned. Amen. It's not just a surface problem. Sin goes directly to the heart of the soul of man, and that is what has to be washed and cleaned by the Word of God. Amen. And this is what this burnt offering typified. Amen. When Christ was up on that cross, this is what he was doing for us. Amen. He hung on that cross. Amen. A whole burnt offering gave him whole self. Amen. And paid the sin debt so our inwards could be washed by the word of God. 
Amen. The whole burnt offering. Amen. This is how ugly sin is. Amen. This is how horrific it would have looked like. Amen. If you could see with the natural eye how bad sin really is. You had no... Amen. There was no excuse. You couldn't, you couldn't say, well, I didn't know how bad sin really is. Because when you would see this and see all the stench and the smell and the smoke and the burning flesh and blood everywhere. Amen. It would be a lot easier to realize how bad sin really is and how deep it really goes. Amen. Now, aren't you glad that you're under the new covenant and you don't have to go through all that? Amen. Praise the Lord. But the whole burnt offering, amen, typified two things. It showed that God would give his best and he would give everything for man to clean our inward parts and cleanse us from sin. And at the same time, it showed us how deep sin really goes and that we ourselves need to give ourselves wholly unto the Lord as well. Amen. Because sin is awful and it's ugly and it'll destroy us if we don't give our heart and life to Christ. Amen. So this was the first offering, amen, that was done at this brazen altar. Amen. The brazen altar was a type of uh, the cross and the animal was a type of Christ. Amen. Amen. And every offering, it was a type of Christ. And this brazen altar was a type of the cross. Amen. Praise the Lord. And so, there was a second offering that was given. It was usually given along with the burnt offering, which was called the meat offering. Now, don't let the name fool you. Amen. In the meat offering, there was no meat given. Amen. Really, it's called a vegetable offering or a food offering. Amen. But the idea of this offering was a thanksgiving offering. He was giving thanks unto the Lord. Amen. And normally this would be done like during a burnt offering. When someone would give a burnt offering, they would normally give a thanksgiving offering. And also they would give a thanksgiving offering usually during the time of first fruits. Like when people would bring in their crops and they wanted to thank the Lord for providing for them and their family. They would take a part of it and they would give it onto the altar as a type of thanks onto the Lord for what he's done. Amen. And this was considered the food offering. And what they would do for the food offering, they would bring an uh, offering of fine flour. Amen. Which was a type of the perfect Christ. Fine flour. Amen. They would pour oil on it. Amen. They would put frankincense on it. And then the priest would take a handful of this offering, throw it on the brazen altar, and then the priest would keep the rest. Amen. And then salt was also added to the offering as well. Amen. And there was no leaven that was allowed to be in the offering. And there was no honey that was allowed to be in the offering. Amen. Now, people here would understand, well, I understand that there's no leaven. Amen. But why wouldn't you put no honey on it? Because didn't honey come out of the rock? <laughs> Amen. Amen. I'll get to that in a minute. But first of all, this offering was a thanksgiving offering, giving thanks unto the Lord for what he's blessed you with and what he's given you. And so you would bring an offering of fine flour. The offer would pour oil on it, which was a type of the Holy Spirit, the fine flour being a type of the perfect Christ. And the frankincense on it was a type of answered prayer. So really, when you was giving the offering... Amen. He was giving an offering which was a type of Christ and him anointed with the Holy Spirit and how the brazen altar and Christ and the Holy Spirit being on him was an answered prayer. Amen. Amen. And so the priest would take a handful of it and put it on the brazen altar and burn it. And then the priest would keep the rest of the offering. Amen. Now, 
Why would the priest get to keep part of the offering? Well, this was a type and shadow to show how a person should give to the work of the Lord because of what the Lord's blessed them with. Amen. Amen. The priest would take a handful of the fine flour with oil, with frankincense, and put it on the brazen altar, showing that through the cross all your blessings come. Amen. Because he's the one that was anointed with the Holy Spirit. Amen. He was an answered prayer to the whole entire world. And he's the one that paid the sin debt. Amen. So grace could flow freely. Amen. And so the, and so the Lord could rain showers of blessing upon you. And whether it be uh, spiritually, whether it be physically, or whether it be uh, financially. Whatever the case was. Amen. And so as a thanks for all the blessings the Lord has provided with you due to the cross, amen, all the Lord would ask is that they give a meat offering, a thanksgiving offering, give you a little back, amen, as, as to show a thanks unto the Lord. And so part of it would be put on the brazen altar, typifying that all blessings come through the cross. The priest would get the rest, typifying, amen, how we should give unto the work of the Lord. Amen. And no leaven was supposed to be in the offering because le leaven was a type of corruption. Amen. Even uh, Jesus himself said a little leaven ruins the whole lump. If you would put a little leaven on this, it would ruin the whole sacrifice, the whole offering. Amen. See, everything Christ said in the New Testament always had connection with the sacrificial system back then. Amen. If you was rich and you had cattle and you had goods, the Lord would ask you to bring a ram or a sheep. If you was poor and didn't have much money and you didn't have a big, um, a lots of animals, because some would say, well, what if they didn't have no sheep? Amen. The Lord also provided in the book of Leviticus, well, if they didn't have sheep, you could use a turtle dove. If you didn't have a turtle dove, you could use a pigeon for those who had less money. Amen. And that's why the Lord really was upset when he went into the temple and he found the money changer selling blemished pigeons, selling blemished rams, selling blemished things and making money off of it instead of being a house of prayer and sacrifice for, amen, the type and shadow of what he would do. And so it made the Lord upset. And that's why he turned tables upside down. And that's why he took uh, the um, horse hair and made a whip and whipped the people and drove them out. Amen. Because it wasn't supposed to have any blemish. Amen. It's supposed to be a free will offering, not a way to make money. So no leaven was supposed to be used. No corruption. Amen. No corruption. Also, no honey was supposed to be put on the offering. Now, in the Bible, honey was a type of blessing. So why in the world would not the Lord want to put honey on the Thanksgiving offering? Amen. Because honey was sweet. Honey was a type of a spiritual, in the spiritual sense, a blessing. He did, he, the Lord, I believe myself, asked not to put no honey on it because he wanted everyone to realize that the blessings didn't come of this world. Amen. But they came because of the brazen altar and the sacrifice that was to come. Amen. Does that make sense? Amen. And when your faith is in this, then honey will come out of the rock. Amen. But the Lord didn't want to get your eyes on just the blessings. Amen. So he said no honey will be put on the meat offering. While honey was a type of a blessing, he didn't want people's eyes getting on the blessing, but the blesser, amen, and wanted to see that your blessings came because of this, amen. Does that make sense tonight? He wanted people to realize that it came through Christ and the cross, amen. It's interesting to note as well Amen. Whenever in the book of Leviticus he always talks about give it on to the Lord, 
talking about giving, and he would say, it is a holy thing made with fire. People don't realize when it says it's a holy thing, it was made with fire. Amen. Amen. What are you saying tonight? You giving to the work of the Lord is not a holy thing where it gives you blessings because you've done this, because you gave this or gave so much. But it was a holy thing because it was made with fire. Amen. Does that make sense? You given to the work of the Lord, amen, doesn't make it holy, and so therefore you merit something with God. Now, if you read in the book of Leviticus, every time he says to give on the work of the Lord or to give or out of free will, he would say it's a holy thing, but it would say made with fire. The holiness came from the brazen altar and the sacrifice and the fire. It didn't come from the person just giving. Amen. Do you get that? Because a lot of preachers preach the uh, greed gospel where they say, well, if you give $50,000, then God will give you 500000 back because it's holy to give on to the Lord. No. The giving part of it wasn't that made it holy. It was the part that was made with fire that was holy. Amen. Amen. If you study the book of Leviticus out, you'll see that when it talks about the different offerings. He would say it's a holy thing made with fire. Amen. All the holiness came because of the sacrifice. Amen. All of our holiness came because of what Jesus did. Amen. And so no leaven was supposed to be used on the meat offering and no honey was supposed to be used on the meat offering as well because he wanted people to realize their blessings came from the cross. It was a holy thing. Amen. Praise the Lord. Got my notes here because there's five different offerings and it's hard to, amen. <laughs> Praise the Lord. And so you had the burnt offering, which is a type of all self given over to the Lord. You're giving yourself wholly to the Lord. And at the same time, the Lord was saying he was going to give everything he had, the best for us. Amen. And that whole burnt offering, there was a whole burnt offering done every day. Amen. One in the morning on the third hour, one in the evening on the ninth hour. Amen. And uh, Christ died on the cross from the third hour all the way to the ninth hour being our burnt offering. And then along with that was the meat offering, the thanksgiving offering. Amen. Now there was three other offerings that were also to be given. It's a lot of offerings. <laughs> Amen. There was the sin offering. The other three offerings was the sin offering, the trespass offering, and the peace offering. Amen. The next one was the sin offering. And the Lord instituted the sin offering for those who sinned out of ignorance. As in they just didn't know any better. They didn't realize it was a sin that what they had done or what they had committed. And it had been brought to their attention saying, hey, you sinned against the Lord. Well, I didn't know that. Okay, well, you need to take a sin offering to the tabernacle then. Or to the brazen altar, excuse me. And the sin offering really typifies and links us with our stages of uh, spiritual growth. Amen. Because when we're young in the Lord and we're growing in the Lord, we make a lot of mistakes and we sin quite often out of ignorance. Well, we just didn't know any better. Amen. So then we ask the Lord to forgive us. Amen. And then we pray and ask the Lord for Him to write it on our hearts so we don't do that anymore. Amen. And this is really what the sin offering was for. It was for sins out of ignorance because you were young in the Lord, amen, or maybe you was a babe and you just didn't understand, you just didn't realize it yet, and that was brought to your attention and what maybe one of the priests or somebody said, hey, that's a sin, you shouldn't be doing that. And they said, oh, I didn't know any better. And they said, well, go bring a sin offering then. And then they would bring a sin offering into the outer court up to the brazen altar. And really, it's a type and shadow at length of how our stages of spiritual growth. How during our spiritual growth we will sin out of ignorance. Amen. But we can be forgiven of those. And this is what the sin offering typified. 
And with this offering, the, you would have to bring a young bullock without blemish. Amen. While the burnt offering was a male without blemish, you had to bring a young one without blemish. Amen. There was no notes, I believe, on the, the young bullock. But me personally, I believe the reason they were to bring a young bullock, amen, because it was a sin out of ignorance and maybe they were still growing in the Lord and still young in the Lord and didn't understand. So a type and shadow is you would bring a young bullock. Amen. But neither be the case. It had to be a young bullock, whether you agree with me or you don't. Amen. And again, you would bring it to the brazen altar. And of course, you would bring the animal in. Most would bring him by a rope. Amen. And they would hand it over to the priest. And once again, he would tie the rope around the brazen altar of the horn. And again, he would lift up the animal, saying, and he would pass the knife to the offerer. Amen. And the offerer would have to slit the throat of that animal. Amen. And again, they would have to lay their hand on the animal transferring their sin from them to the animal, a type of a substitute of what Christ would do for us. The priest would hand you the knife. You would have to take the knife. The priest would hold up the animal once again, and you would have to cut the throat once again and spew all the blood out again. Amen? Amen. And once again, blood had to be shed for the forgiveness of sin. Well, did he have to, if he sinned out of ignorance, did he have to give another burnt offering? No. All he had to do was give a sin offering. Amen. Well, why didn't he have to do a whole burnt offering along with the sin offering? Amen. I'll put it, this is the best analogy I can put. When you're young in the Lord and you're growing and you sin. Do you have to get resaved over? No. You're already saved. Once you're saved, you're saved. Amen. Now, don't get me wrong. You were supposed to bring in out of your own volunteer one in the morning and one in the evening every day. Amen. But uh, in between those times, if you would sin or do something wrong and you would bring a sin offering, you wouldn't have to bring a whole burnt offering as well because, amen, typified, you're already saved. You're just young in the Lord. You're growing. You don't have to get resaved over and over and over again. Amen. Because you're sealed with the Holy Spirit. But in the Old Testament type, you did have to bring a sin offering. It was a type and a shadow how Christ would pay for our sins if we sinned out of ignorance. And so they would bring the animal in, tie it on the horns, amen, and then pass the knife over, and then they would lift up the throat, and you would have to slit it, and the blood would spew out. And the priest, he would take the basin, amen. He would take the basin, and he would take the blood, and he would start to go into the tabernacle. But before he could go into the tabernacle, he had to wash his hands, amen, at the great laver. He had to wash his hands and wash his feet before he went into the tabernacle, amen. Now you may ask, well, what did that do? Be here next Thursday, and I'll tell you. Amen. But he would go in and after stopping at the great laver and washing his hands and feet, he would pick up the basin again and once again proceed into the tabernacle. And when he would come into the tabernacle, on the left side would be uh, the lamp, the golden lampstick, amen, it would be lit with the seven candles, and on the right would be the showbread, and in front would be another altar, the altar of incense. And I'm not going to get into that tonight either. But what he would do is he would take this basin after being all washed. He would dip his finger, amen, in this basin of blood. And he would sprinkle blood round about in front of the veil seven times. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I don't know if that's how they sprinkled it, but hey, amen. I'm not 3,500 years old. But uh, they would sprinkle it seven times. Amen. And then the priest would take some of the blood and put it on the altar of incense as well. Amen. Now, why would he put it on the altar incense? Because even though we sin out of ignorance, the altar of incense, a type of worship and a type of prayer, even when we sin out of ignorance and we don't know any better, 
it does frustrate grace and it does frustrate, amen, worship and our prayers. Amen. Even if it's out of ignorance. And so the blood still had to be applied and he would dip his finger and apply it and sprinkle it seven times in front of the veil of the Holy of Holies and put some blood on the altar incense. Amen. So that worship and prayers could be restored once again. Even out of sins of ignorance. And then he would turn around and he would come back. Amen. To the brazen altar. And he would pour the rest of the blood at the base of the brazen altar. Amen. Now, can you imagine three million people in a camp those priests were kept pretty busy. All day long, burnt offerings going up. All day long, sin offerings going up. All day long, trespassing offerings going up. Can you imagine all the blood that was round about this altar? Three million people around an area, I believe it was 175 feet long by 75 feet wide, somewhere around there. Now, can you imagine that much blood? It was a bloody, gory mess. Amen. And the flesh burning all day, all night. The cross is not pretty, but it worked. It works. Amen. And so he would pour the blood at the base of this altar, at the brazen altar once again. And the priest would take the fat and some of the inward parts, like the kidneys, the liver, and they would throw it up on the brazen altar and just burn the inward parts. Amen. So, what would they do with the rest of the carcass then? Because the whole burnt offering, they put everything all in the altar. Okay, so if they only put some of the inward parts and the fat of the beast up on the altar, what would they do with the rest of the carcass? Amen. They would take the rest of the carcass, take it outside a camp, and burn it where they would dump the ashes. Amen. Now, why would they do that? Again, as I said a little bit earlier this evening, amen, just in the New Testament, when you're saved, you don't have to keep getting resaved over and over again. So they didn't have to throw the whole carcass on there because they were saved. Amen. But they would take it outside a camp and put the carcass on a fire where they normally dispose the ashes outside a camp. And it would burn down the rest of the carcass to ashes. And then, it, because it would be an outside a camp out in the wilderness, the wind would just take, just blow the ashes everywhere and blow the ashes and spread them out into the wilderness. And we know in the Bible, the wind is a type of the Holy Spirit. And what the Lord was saying was, your sins have been forgive, forgiven and they've been forgotten. Because in the wind, the Holy Spirit would take, amen, take all the sins away. The Lord. Amen. And that's what the sin offering typified when they would take the carcass outside a camp, put it on a fire, outside a camp, burn it. It would burn down in the ashes, and then the wind would just naturally take it away. A type of shadow of how all our sins would be taken away. Amen. Never to be remembered ever again, even out of ignorance. Amen. The sin offering. But of course, as you grew in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord, your sin offering should be getting fewer. <laughs> Amen. And guess what? Your trespass offerings are probably increasing. Amen. <laughs> Praise the Lord. I only did three sin offerings this week. Well, how many trespass songs you had? Oh, 11, 12? <laughs> Amen. But the next one would be a trespass offering. Amen. And the trespass offering were sins that were deliberately done. You weren't ignorant about it. You knew better, but you did it anyways. Amen. And so you would have to give a trespass offering. And really, this trespass offering, how it links us is to our stages and our walk with the Lord. Amen. How the sin offering linked us to our stages of our Christian growth because we were young in the Lord, our trespass offerings linked us with our walk, where we would sin and knew better. Amen? And so for 
the trespass offering, you would bring a female bullock to the brazen altar. Amen. And the whole burnt offering, you would bring a male without blemish. Amen. And the meat offering, you would bring a thing of fine flour. And the sin offering, you would bring a young bullock. And the trespass offering, you would bring a female bullock to the brazen altar. And tonight, there was different things you may have had to have bring depending on what the sin was, but I'm not going to get into that tonight. I'm going to get into the basics. And what I mean by that is, if you sinned against your brother or sister in the Lord, amen, you may have had to bring some shekel along with you. If you sinned against the Lord, you would bring something else, but I'm not going to get into the different aspects of that. I just want to get to the basis tonight of what the trespass offering was. And so you would bring a female bullock to the brazen altar. And once again, you would bring it in. They would tie the rope around the horns, amen. The uh, priest would pass you the knife while he held up the throat, and you would slit the animal's throat and kill it. And then the priest would take the blood and put it on the side of the altar. And then he would pour the rest at the base. Amen. And then the Bible says that the priests would have to take the meat, the flesh of the animal, and eat it. <laughs> Amen. And then it also says that the priests would get to keep the skins of the animal for their own personal use. This is what Jesus was talking about when, I believe it's in the book of John, when his disciples were following him. Amen. And he turned around and started preaching the message of the cross to him. And he said, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life. Amen. His disciples were walking. He was talking about this offering. Because when they sinned out of ignorance, amen, or uh, uh, deliberately, excuse me, and Israel did. They did. Jesus would say, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life. And this trespass offering, if you sin deliberately, amen, if you didn't take a trespass offering, amen, and the priest didn't have an animal and eat the carcass, amen, or the flesh of it, amen, you could have no life. This is what Jesus was talking about. They knew exactly what he was talking about, and that's why a lot of them walked away from him when he made that statement. Amen. Because in this offering... They would kill the animal. The blood would be put on the side of the brazen altar. And then they would dump the rest at the base. And then the priest would have to take the flesh of the animal and eat the animal. And then the priest could keep the skins of the animal for their own personal use. Amen. A type and shadow of how Christ and what he did at the cross, amen, covered and took away our sins. Just like what he did for Adam on the first sin that had ever happened, amen, where God himself took an animal, amen, killed it, and then covered Adam and Eve with the animal skin. Amen. amen. Now, if you was very poor, and you couldn't afford, and you did sin out of, uh, deliberately, and you couldn't afford a sheep, you couldn't, you didn't have rams, you didn't have goats, you didn't, you could use fine flour for this offering. But you couldn't put no oil and you couldn't put no frankincense on it. Now with the meat offering you could, but with this offering you couldn't do that. There was to be no oil and there was to be no frankincense on it. Now why, on the trespass offering, why would they do that? Why wouldn't they allow oil on it, which is the type of the Holy Spirit, now, if the oil is a type of the Holy Spirit and frankincense is a type of answer prayer, wouldn't you think, and the fine flour a type of Christ, wouldn't you think there would be oil on it and wouldn't you think there would be frankincense put on it? Amen? But there wasn't. Because up on the cross, when he was up on that cross, the Holy Spirit, amen, told him when he could die, but couldn't help him. Amen? And the Lord would say up on the cross, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? 
Amen. The Lord wouldn't answer the prayer. Amen. Wouldn't answer any prayers for him to come down. And the Holy Spirit wouldn't help him get down off the cross because he was supposed to be the offering for all humanity. Amen. Now don't get me wrong. He laid down his life. Amen. He never sinned in thought, word, or deed. But while he was on the cross, amen, he himself had to take the whole punishment for all mankind. And this was the one time that the Holy Spirit couldn't help him. Now, he led him and guide him and told him when he could die and when his time, when it was finished. But it was the one time he couldn't deliver him off the cross because it had to be done. And so, therefore, for all the sins of all mankind, so therefore, in the trespass offering, there was no oil to be put on it and there was no frankincense to be put on it. Amen? If you were poor. I hope that makes sense tonight. Lord, take it to their hearts and let them understand, whether it be here or on internet. Amen? Because when you get into these offerings and that, it can get very confusing. Amen? And so if you was very poor, again, you could use fine flour, but no oil and no frankincense was to be put on it. And finally, because I'm running out of time, so I'm going to hurry, you had the peace offering. Now, the peace offering was done usually during festival times. Amen. And the peace offering, the idea was that the person had peace with God. And again, because they had peace with God, they would usually do this during festivals that was going on. Amen. And it was an acknowledge, acknowledgement on the blessing on a person's life. And so the person could bring a bullock, a male or a female, without blemish to the brazen altar. And again, the offerer would lay his hand on the animal and kill it. And the priest would sprinkle the blood upon the altar round about. And the fat was put on the altar again. And some inward parts. And the carcass, or the flesh, and whatever the flesh was left over of the animal, part of it was given to the priests, and part of it was given back to the offer and his family. And they had to all eat it the same day. Amen. And not only that, they would bring unleavened cakes with oil. And they would bring leavened cakes as well. And again, all of this, a portion of it would be put on the brazen altar except for the leavened cakes. Except for the leaven cakes, all of them would have a portion put on the brazen altar and then a portion would go to the priest and a portion would go to the family and the offer to, and they all had to eat it the same day. Amen. And it typified how the person had peace with God. Amen. And again, this was normally done during festival times, during celebrations. And again, the unleavened cakes with oil typified Christ, but the leavened cakes typified us. Amen. I'll say that again. The, leaven cake, the unleavened cakes typified Christ with the oil, the Holy Spirit. But the, un, but the leaven cakes typified us. Amen. And they couldn't go on the altar. Amen. I don't care what you do. You can't sanctify yourself. You can't save yourself. Amen. And the leaven cakes couldn't go on the altar. Amen. But there was a portion of leaven cakes. Amen. And we would have to eat it showing that we were sinners. Amen. We've sinned. And only through the brazen altar and the sacrifice can we have peace with God. And then the unleavened bread... Amen, with the oil would be eaten as well, along with the uh, part of the animal typifying that what Christ would do with the cross, amen, being our sacrifice, we could have peace with God. And it was done during celebration times. The best analogy one can give of what the peace offering really was in the New Testament is the Lord's Supper. Amen. That's the closest thing that we have in the New Testament is the Lord's Supper, compared to the peace offering. Amen. Because we have accepted Christ by faith of what He's done at the cross and shed His blood. We take uh, 
the Lord's Supper and remembrance as a memorial for what he's done for us, showing where our faith is lied, and we would eat the bread and we would drink the wine. The same idea was back for the Old Testament with the peace offering. They would do it during celebrations, they would do it during festivals, do it during times of rejoicing, amen, as a way of breaking bread together, showing how they had peace with God. Amen, and that's what the peace offering was for. Again, as I said tonight, the closest thing that I can explain or show in the New Testament of a peace offering is the Lord's Supper. And again, this also typifies they ate the flesh of the animal. Again, Jesus said, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life. You have no peace with God. Amen. Because he was the Lamb of God that was put on that altar for you and me. Amen. And without this brazen altar in the Old Testament, we had no forgiveness of sins and we had no peace with God. And not only that, you can't get to the great laver. Amen. Which was a type of being cleansed by the word of God. You couldn't get into the tabernacle where there was the 12 loaves of the bread on the uh, altar to show bread. You couldn't get to the Holy Spirit, which was a type of the golden lamp. You couldn't get into the Holy of Holies, and you couldn't get to the altar of incense, which was a type of prayer and worship. Without this brazen altar, without blood, there is no remission of sin. Amen. I don't care what you do in the church. You can have all the programs you want. Amen. You can have people give as much as they can. You can memorize as much scriptures as you want. You can do as much prayer as you want. You can fast as much as you want. But if there is no blood being preached, and if there is nobody putting their faith in the blood, I'm sorry. There's no remission of sins, and the rest is in vain. Amen. It was in the old covenant, no brazen altar, all the rest is in vain. It's the same in the new covenant. No cross of Christ, no cross, no Jesus Christ and crucified, no shed blood of Jesus being preached and nobody putting their faith in. I'm sorry, the rest is all vain. You can't get to it. Amen. The brazen altar, it was the most important piece in the whole tabernacle. Now, people would want to argue with that and say, no, the Holy of Holies was the most important piece because it held the Ark of the Covenant. It held Aaron's staff, which budded. It held manna from the wilderness. It had the presence of the Lord in between the cherubims and the mercy seat. It had the Ten Commandments. Oh, that's the most important part. But how are you going to get to it without the brazen altar? I'll say that again. How are you going to get to it without the brazen altar? Aaron's staff, which budded, which is a type of resurrection, the Ten Commandments, the manna, the presence of God in between the cherubims and the mercy seat. How are you going to get to that without the blood? You can't. You can't. So ergo, the most important piece in the whole tabernacle was the brazen altar because you can't get to anything else without it. And not only that, it was the most largest sacred vessel in the whole tabernacle, showing its importance. Amen. It was seven and a half feet long, seven and a half feet wide, and four and a half feet tall. The biggest vessel. Amen. That's why the church needs to get back to its first love. Amen. The blood of Jesus. When it leaves its first love, if you read in the book of Revelations where he warns the seven churches, you see a pattern happen. First it leaves its first love. Amen. And then once it leaves its first love, amen, it's dead on the inside but alive on the outside with activities. Amen. And after that it becomes religious. And then after that it becomes lukewarm and it's back outside of Christ again. The first love is the brazen altar, the blood of Jesus. Amen. Without that, there's no remissions of sins. And without that, you can't get to anything else. I can't stress that enough. 
without blood. Amen. Oh yes, it was messy. It was very messy. I mean, think of it. Three million people. Three million people giving up sacrifices day and night and plus sin offerings, trespass offerings, and in times of festivals, peace offerings. There was a lot of blood. There was a lot, a lot of blood. Compare it. If you, I'll compare it to size. Just think, if this was a brazen altar, this pulpit, imagine 2,000 people in Deschler coming with an animal, sacrificing it, and pouring the blood out all around this. It'd be a lot of blood. Amen? That's the best comparison I can give. Because think about it. Three million people around a tabernacle, 175 feet long and like 75 some feet wide. Okay, think of this building, try on the house, 2,000 people, and then bringing their offerings in through that door and then pouring blood and sprinkling blood all around this thing. It would not look pretty. And not only that, amen, smoke going up and flesh, the smell of burnt flesh. There's one other thing about the brazen altar. If you noticed, they was in the wilderness. And so they was on the move. Amen. For 40 years. And they had straves put on it. And a post that would go through on both sides where they could pick it up and take it with them. Amen. Well, what are you saying? This is what Jesus meant when he said, deny your cross, or deny yourself, take up your cross daily and follow me. It's not talking about picking up a cross and suffering all day long, but it's typifying putting your faith in Jesus every day. Guess what? When they moved camp, the altar, the brazen altar didn't get left behind. They didn't get left behind and then they would build a new one. No. They would deny their self, knowing they needed a sacrifice, a Messiah. And when they would move, they would take up their cross. Amen? They would take up their cross. Because this is where the heart of their, how to get to the God, this was the heart of it. And they knew this was the only way to get to God, was through the brazen altar. So what they had to do was take up their cross, pick it up, and take it with them. They didn't go beyond the cross. They didn't make a new one. They picked it up and took it with them wherever they went. Amen. That's what Jesus was talking about when he said, deny yourself. Amen. You need a Savior. That's me. Not me, me, but Jesus. You just say, deny yourself because you need a Savior. You can't do it. Take up your cross <laughs> and follow me. And that's exactly what they did, type and shadow in the Old Testament. They denied yourself, bringing a sacrifice, a type of Christ. And whenever they would move, they'd pick up their brazen altar and they would take it with them. They didn't go beyond it by leaving it behind and go beyond and leave it there in the wilderness. Amen. I know resurrection people aren't going to like that. But I'm sorry. You can't get to the resurrection without the brazen altar. You can't get to Aaron's staff which budded unless you have a brazen altar. And you can't build a new brazen altar. You've got to pick up the one you got and take it with you. Amen. Amen. Deny yourself. Take up your cross. That's what they had this for. Amen. This through the stray so they, the priest could pick it up and take it with them when they moved camp. Amen. Can't go beyond the cross. You got to pick it up and take it with you. When they made cap, they set that brazen altar down and they started making sacrifices again. Amen. Amen. Would you stand? The brazen altar. The next, next Thursday, when you understand how important the cross is and the brazen altar and the shed blood then and only then can the Holy Spirit start doing the work on the inside. Amen. And start washing you clean. Amen. I'll say that again. Only 
when you understand the importance of the blood of Jesus, and without it, there's no remissions of sin, and with your faith in that, and wherever you go, taking up your cross, and taking it with you, your faith, then and only then can the Holy Spirit write His laws on your heart, amen, and wash you thoroughly. Amen. Which was what a type of the great laver was. A type of the word of God washing us clean every day. Amen. But I'm not going to get into that tonight. Amen. But again, you can't be washed by the word of God until first you meet the brazen altar. Amen. And realize without this, there is no remissions of sins. There is no cleansing. There is nothing else. So you'd have to put your faith and trust that God would accept this sacrifice. Then and only then can the Holy Spirit and the Word of God do its work on us. Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, Lord, I've done my best to explain the brazen altar, a type and shadow of what Jesus would do at the cross and its importance, Lord. Without it, there's no remissions of sin. Without it, there's no cleansing by the Word of God. Without it, there's no resurrection life. Without it, there's no baptism of the Holy Spirit. Lord, I ask that you take it to people's hearts and let them understand, Lord, how important the blood of your Son, Jesus, really is and how it washes us clean. Amen. And Lord, we'll give you all the praise and glory in Jesus' name. Amen.